here we are. We're back. And yeah, <laughs> here we are. We're back. <laughs> JR and Lisa here with Ask Your Father podcast. When, when your heart is ready to hear the truth, we're here for you. So today we're going to take and kind of loop back around and uh, kind of revisit where we dropped off on our last podcast. And Lisa, I think if I, if I remember correctly, we were going to kind of go back and talk about, um, well, why don't you tell me what we're going to talk about? That's, that's always better. <laughs> I thought that maybe we would go back and touch on generations and parents yeah. and father's fathers and our parents yeah. and just maybe all the way back to Adam and Eve. I don't know. Sure. If you want to. Yeah. 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 But one thing I want to sell, tell folks is that, to be really clear, as we're sharing about uh, the contributing factors to our life, the people that were influencers and impactors in our life, that we are not here operating out of unforgiveness. We're not here uh, operating out of judgment. We're not here to take and point the finger and bring blame. Because the reality is, is that we have a responsibility to take and deal with what we've been given so that we can make it right. And we do that. We do it from a biblical perspective of, you know, uh, repenting for the way that we reacted to it and taking and renouncing that, you know, in fact, in the scriptures, it's pretty clear over and over again, uh, we see the prophets, they went and they actually renounced the sins of their forefathers. Mm -hmm. And so in other words, there's a, there is legitimately a, uh, a curse that follows the sin of our forefathers. And it can be hidden and we have no clue. In fact, I've had people who come through our reset workshop and they're like, hey, uh, I never really knew my parents. I was an orphan or I never knew my dad. I never knew my grandparents. And I, I really understood that because of my own journey. But I just just to say, folks, that we're not here to, to point the finger at somebody else. What we're here to do is finger what contributed, how it influenced and impacted. And then what we're going to do is unpack that and see what, we, what we're supposed to do with it. I'll turn it over to you, Sri. Yeah. No, that's perfect. I think um, one of the things that I remembered... In, in, in as part of the school and training that I'm doing right now is the importance of a name. So I'm going to, I think we'll be able to tie this back together. But uh, when I am, I'm going through, currently I'm going through my parents' house and the house that I grew up with. And there's a lot of really amazing things that, and I call them treasures. Each time I go into my mom's room, she was a big journal. She wrote journals all the time. And we and we had such a great relationship, but obviously, um, she kept a lot of her. You know, she she journaled a lot, so I got another peek into her life. Yeah. Um, as I'm doing right now. Now I would have, I have my best friend on alert. So when I pass, there's going to be a bonfire with my journals because I don't want them to be found. I don't think, but. Um, that's funny, not funny, but it is funny. But I, uh, but what's really neat is I found this uh, graduation prayer that my mom wrote to to the Heavenly Father, and I don't I don't recall ever seeing it, but it's this notion about my name and its meaning. So Lisa means dedicated to God, and or oath of God, and I think that that is where it all started for me. Cause I talked about in the last session, just this love and, and, and just passion for Jesus that I can't explain that just sort of foundationally, that's how I think that, you know, I'm created to love and I, I love my creator. And I love finding this note because it was just an, it affirmed also that she also knew when she named me that that's what it meant. And right now I'm discovering through all of these trainings that we're going through, how intentional God is with our first names. And so I think it's really interesting to see that she understood and knew that back then. 
Mm. and how that is a footprint, I think, on my life and how I want to live, albeit taking different paths, as I said, different trails along my life. But I just I wanted to pause there and, and see if you had some comments around names as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the the importance of our names is huge. For instance, John means a gift from God or God is gracious. My middle name is Randolph, which means wolf shield. And my last name actually means lamb or shepherd in Portuguese. And so it's a very, you know, when you put that all together, what you have is somebody who is there to be a protector of the sheep as a shepherd and yet with the heart of the lamb. And so, you know, it's so, you know, when you start adding to it and actually what I was thinking of Lisa, when I heard you speaking about your own name is I was wondering, ah, I wonder what her mother's name is and what that means. And Lynn. One, so I'm wondering if, if we take these things and kind of line them out and you start saying yeah. dad's name and her name and, and, you know, do you start seeing a pattern, a history or a story that's being told? Cause we know in the scriptures that all these names had a meaning and they literally tell a story generationally. When you go and look at the generational line of Jesus in the book of Matthew, it literally is a story about the coming of the Messiah and the fulfillment mm -hmm. of all prophecy. So names are very specific. And I know it was your mom that gave you the name, but we know who is the author and the finisher of our, of our story. It's father God. And he, he knew that little Lisa was going to come into the world and he's going to come through Lynn. And he knew the struggles you, and, and, you know, choices that you were going to make. And yet throughout all that, he loved you and you loved him. That's the part that's really interesting. I think is that I think there are so many people who are conflicted out there because how can I, how can God love me? I mean, I love him, but how can he love me because I'm such a, you know, this or that, or I, you know, I, I don't mm -hmm. feel like I'm worthy of that. Did you ever have any of that struggle when you were walking through, even though you, you had this love as a kid and yet went off the trail? I Did think you? that, yeah, sure. Cause I think that when we are, God designed us for a relationship with him. And that's, I continue to learn that and feel that in my walk. Yeah. And I think that, there was always this tension of, of not wanting to disappoint him and not wanting to, you know, and, and as a young, as a young adult, you know, I, I tell my son all the time, this is not developed yet. <laughs> like you're making big decisions and this is not developed yet. Right. Uh, yeah. So I think that we all can, you know, especially growing up and then, and we talked a lot about how the enemy really goes and starts attacking early at, at, at an early age uh, to our kids. And there's, and you can see that today, there's a ton of confusion going on. There's, you know, am I this, am I that, am I, I, I can't even keep up with the descriptions of, of how people want to be just referred to today. And, uh, and I have a heart for that because I think that there's, if, if we really just dig in and look at the full picture of what's going on, uh, what we can see and what we can't see, I think there's just so much more to the story than just, than just what is, right? Where we are, we are created for Christ and we are created to love him. And so to answer your question, I kind of went off track there for a second, but to answer your question, absolutely. I um, There was tension there for sure. And I think it's always, and even in my adult life, when I was operating outside of, you know, the things that I knew, um, he, he puts boundaries in place for us to be safe and to guard our hearts. Because I think that's the tragedy also too, is that it feels like it's just a bunch of rules. Like, oh, I can't do this, or I can't go have sex, and I can't have this because God doesn't want me to have fun. And really, it's more about protecting our hearts from, from hurt. And that's a good loving father. 
And if you start looking at it that way, I think the, the narrative really changes a whole lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so for me, the way that I was able to make peace with, with all the brokenness in my own journey was coming to the understanding that God can take and use evil for good. Mm-hmm. If, that, if that weren't the case, then neither you or I would be here with this podcast. We wouldn't have the willingness yeah. to step forward and, and be a light, hopefully, to people who are, you know, maybe coming out of the same shadows that you and I both walked in of sexual brokenness, identity you know, issues and just, you know, I, I don't know of anybody who doesn't have identity issues, honestly. Right. Yeah. Even the most verbose and and seemingly most confident people, if you get back, you know, behind the veneer, behind the curtain of their life, you'll find typically there's places in your life they feel really uh, tentative about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's just as we should in a way, because if, if we, otherwise, I think we'll turn into, um, Egotists, megalomaniacs, I don't know, something something short of what God wanted us to be, which is, you know, just a little lower than the angels, you know, and yet created in his image. And, you know, even the word Christian means little Christ, little, Christ, little Messiah, you know. So mm-hmm. we're, we're actually created to be really powerful and authentic beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, yet it takes humility. And I think I once heard of I once heard a uh, a great teaching, and this pastor was talking about you know, God doesn't have a problem with making men great. What He has a problem with is helping them remain small. Mm. And so, coming into that place of where, even as we talked about doing this podcast, I think there's a little bit of fear and trepidation there. You know, excited to share, excited to 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 see other people's lives transform. But at the same point in time, we know there are people who are going to be offended, and people who will take this and and you know pervert even what the things we say in yeah. love and and you know with a desire to see people's lives transformed and set free. And it's like God bless them. You know, the fact that they actually end up um, expressing themselves that way is going to undertake and become uh, a, a, a problem for them. So uh, I don't know, uh, but if you could talk a little bit about the um, going into, we, we talked about college and the friendships that you had and the relationships. You said you were both in with men and females, were you kind of playing both sides of the fence? Were you not sure of, of whether you were heterosexual or homosexual or were you bisexual? I mean, what, cause a lot of people that are going to be listening are going to be like, you know, I don't know what I am, but I, you know, I like, uh, so I don't know what you, but could you share some of that, some of that? I think that I, that's a great question. First Thank of all, you. um, you're welcome. I think that I was, You know, I think my first, I will go back even to high school. I totally fell head over heels over this guy in high school. And he was a little bit older than I was. And he was a Christian and he was in summer track with me. And I just love, love, love. I just, I probably obsessed over him a little bit, but (laughs) he lived in Dallas. I lived, um, you know, further south and And he went off to college, but it was kind of a heartbreak for me because I had set my standard to this guy, loved Mm. the Lord. We spent time together. And Mm. I think that that sort of set up a disappointment for me. And I do remember my mom saying it, I do. There's again, moments of critique with my mom. And I don't think she, again, I don't think she was aware a hundred percent of it, but (laughs) she said, you know, Lisa, his dad has receding hair. So when he gets older, he's probably going to be bald. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know, and I don't think that she, she meant, and sure enough he is, but that's neither the point, but, (laughs) um, but it was kind of this, you know, unspoken critique somehow of, here I'd found what in my mind was 
a good Christian guy. He was in sports. We did the same sports. He's, he's brilliant, super smart. And um, Lord knows I have to keep up with him on that. He's engineering. But it, that was kind of one of my first sort of big heartbreaks is because I really had hoped that. So, we so I, got a, I got a question now. Yeah. You know how okay. I, you know how I am. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, all right. So you're both believers. Yeah. That's part of the attraction because water seeks its own level. Right. I like and, that saying. Yeah. And so here you are. And all of a sudden he goes off to college and little Lisa's left behind. Yeah. And uh, you thought you'd found the true you in him. And now you're without him. Was there a moment, do you think, just, just, you know, you may not know the answer to this right now, but maybe it'd be one of these things that you think about and come back later and, and, and discuss it, that you judged God on that. Do you think that you were like, what's up with that, God? This is the perfect guy for me. I love this guy. I have vision for the future here with him. I, I you know, and where it was the heartbreak also potentially a breach in your relationship with God hmm. because you felt like this was actually answering a question that was in your heart. Am I this or am I that? And you found <laughs> something that was the right direction and all of a sudden it's removed. That's a really great question. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not aware of where I would be disappointed and frustrated with the Lord. But I also will tell you in all transparency that I've really had a hard time getting upset with God. Like I haven't, I've really struggled with that. And I know that I have been frustrated. I don't understand why things happen mm -hmm. and there's so much mystery. And I have like, why did my mom get Alzheimer's when mm -hmm she was seeking him so vigilantly yeah. for all of her life. And she got it at an early age, she got it in her sixties and mm -hmm. passed at 74. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, these things happen and I, I don't know how, I don't know that John, that I know how to get mad at God for things. I know I don't understand them. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it was a, it was a disappointment for me. Um, yeah. I wonder as, as I'm hearing you, well, yeah, I have the good fortune. I actually can remember that you said in the last podcast about how you never saw your parents have arguments. They, <laughs> you know, they didn't, they didn't have cross words. There was no arguments. And I'm thinking that is, that's a standard. Mm -hmm. it's like, you don't get mad with the person that you're in love right. with, the person right. you're in covenant with, you know? Yeah. And so I'm you know, sort of like, you know, oh, I can't do that. And yet, and, I, and I've, I've met other people who have who struggled with that. It's like, you know, I couldn't dare get mad at God. <laughs> He's God. And yeah. yet, it's, it's, it's just one of those questions I need to ask because I've seen so many people not realize that they actually had made a judgment and it became an inner vow to them mm -hmm. that, well, if God's not going to give me what I feel is best for me, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go take whatever I want because it doesn't seem to matter to God mm -hmm. what I want. Yeah. There's also another point where just in therapy, my therapist wondered if part of my direction also wasn't from rebellion from my mom, like mm -hmm. trying to be this person and this my whole life. Yeah. And yeah. she's going to criticize. She, <laughs> so bad. Uh, crit, I mean, critical It you know, just she criticize. And then, so, well, that didn't work. Then, you know, I don't know what will. I, and I think there are times where I felt like, even though I knew she was really proud of me and that she loved me with all her heart, I I don't know that I ever felt like I met up to what she needed me to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, when you're talking about your mom 
reflecting to you that the young man that you were interested in, his father had a receding hairline. It's like my mom used to say to me, you know, you can marry, you can marry a rich woman as, as, as well as a poor one. You know, it was, it was just a different dynamic that you mm -hmm. know, there, weren't, there wasn't any, I, I think she would also rephrase that and say, you know, you can fall in love with a rich woman as, as well as you can a, a poor one. And it's like, really, you know, even back then I kind of questioned, it's like, no, I think God has someone, you know, that's mm -hmm. right fit, except God wasn't part of my equation back then. I just, yeah. you know, I just knew that there was someone who was, you know, the right fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, wow. Okay. So uh, let's see, where are we at now? <laughs> so what happened after he left? Did, did you just kind of go off the rails? Well, he went off to college and we spent a little bit of time together, but then it just, it trailed off, which, I mean, that's just, that's normal. I think I was a sophomore in high school and he was a freshman at, uh, freshman in, in college. And so at that point, after that, though, interestingly enough, that's when sort of the, the um, friendship, my friendship with, with my girlfriend evolved into a little bit more too. So we yeah. still sort of date around, but then, you know, had a little bit more going on in the background. So, yeah. So kind of living a, uh, you know, this is, this is the way that, that I preface it. I was living a lie on the, on the outside. It looked one way, but on the inside, it was another or behind closed doors. It was another way. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that was kind of where you were entering into that deviant kind of lifestyle or that dual yeah. identity kind of a thing is that is that accurate yeah i'd say it's it was dual um because i think that i was certainly you know i guess i felt in some way even though he's going off to college and that was silly and it it felt like rejection to me because mm -hmm. that's you know i really really you know really really liked him so much and <clears throat> and so you know, maybe, maybe the other route was safer for me. And in, in my head, it was a safer route. Right. Yeah. And one thing I want to bring up from our last discussion, which you brought up that is super interesting to me is this notion of adrenaline. And, and I said to you after we, after the last one, I said, you know what, I wonder if I've been addicted to that adrenaline for for years now, like how, how long has that been going on? Yeah. And I, I think that's an interesting point too, is how, how much of our lives too, as we're living it out, that we really get addicted to things that are not healthy for us and huh. somehow continue to keep living it out in different ways. Yep. You know, yep. Oh yeah. No, I definitely see that as being a, a great question. And, and this, you know, this is the nice part about what we do here at the ask your father podcast is that we, we may have some answers. We may have some really responses, I think is what a better way to say, because I think the path is different for everybody, but I think the process of, of having a discussion is very uh, therapeutic, very appropriate, very healthy to, to take a look at, some of these things and start asking yourself, hmm, okay, I'm a risk taker. If I'm a risk taker, I'm gonna tell you right now, there is adrenaline in your in your psyche. There's there's a need for speed. There, you know, there's a need for for some some sort of a of a tension going on. Yeah. That, that there just, you go. You know, and you might see it in some people who are who are uh, chaos creators. There are some people who will create chaos because they cannot stand when peace prevails in their life. So they just have to keep that, that constant chaos going. Now, I, I look at some of that as being demonic. I look at some of this stuff as being, you know, <clears throat> yeah, we can get on a lot of trails here, but I'm just going to say, I personally believe that the demonic, though it is a spiritual realm, they can influence our flesh. Mm -hmm. They know how to keep that plate spinning. So whether it's with thoughts, I think that's part of the other thing we wanted to kind of just dip into for a minute was to say, hey, you know, sometimes these thoughts are our own. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes these thoughts are provoked by an outside source. 
Yeah. And these days we know we can look to the media, we can listen to music, we can listen, we can, we can watch podcasts, we can, we can dive into all kinds of dark stuff. Uh, my wife and I, it was funny this last, this last year or so, we were, we were comparing songs that we used to listen to as kids. And we started to look up the lyrics on the songs and we were mortified. We were like, oh no. <laughs> Did you know that that song was talking about, you know, prostitution? Did you know that that song was talking about, you know, uh, I mean, these are some of my favorite artists, John Cougar Mellencamp, you know, the backseat debutante, you know, what is she doing in the backseat, you know? And it's like, so you wonder where all this promiscuity and all this stuff going on, you know, you wonder why we end up with people saying friends with benefits. It was, this stuff was, was percolating in the media. It was percolating, you know, in you know, in the groups that we were hanging out with. Like I said, water seeks its own level. If somebody gets inoculated with junk, I mean, the old expression is "garbage in, garbage out." If somebody gets inoculated in the education system, or by the music they're listening to, or by the people they're hanging out with, the people with their family members, and they become, you know, for instance, even with people who committed sexual offenses, they find out that. Over 70% of those who commit sexual offenses, whether male or female, whether whether young or old, by the way, and these days, the, uh, the, the, the greatest movement of sexual offenders is actually in the teens, but they're finding that they themselves were victims of molestation. And so this just shows us how much we can get programmed by the influence, the impact, the trauma, the... Uh, just the messages we receive and how it impacts our identity going down the road is just huge. I mean, I, I went through a lot of the same identity stuff myself um, when I was in high school, when um, in private school, there were, there were events that took place that were sexual um, with, you know, we were in dormitories, right? I, I had roommates and I, there was some jacked up, you know, sexual stuff going on there with guys who had him moans that, you know, wouldn't quit. And they were like, I don't care. I just, I want to, you know, do something with anything as long as, as long as I feel good because we were in that feel good generation. And it wasn't meant to be emotional. Like what you're talking about with your girlfriends, you're, you're talking, I'm talking about guys that, you know, totally disassociated. So how are we going to get intimate with women if we can't even, you know, the most intimate thing that's supposed to take place between, a man, a woman is sex. And yet, you know, my life, I was, you know, I was basically defiled in, in regard to, you know, being a victim at a young, very young age. And then again in high school and then realizing when I was 16, I lost my virginity to a woman who was 26 years old. And I didn't think that was, you know, uh, abuse. I didn't see anything wrong with it. I thought, you know, Hey, <laughs> I, I got, I got laid, you know, this is great. And it's, it's like, but going back and looking at it, it's like, no, that's really unhealthy mm -hmm. and appropriate. Yeah. And it just set the stage to take and continually take and bring me into a desensitized state of objectifying myself, objectifying others, and just running down the road and doing whatever I wanted to do as long as I didn't get caught and it felt good. Yeah. And just was a train wreck. Bless God. It all starts, as you pointed out to me a couple weeks ago. Where where did the lie start? Yes. Where where in my life? And it's still today. Like, what lie did I believe that I aligned with that led me down this road? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great for us, place for us to, to stop today's podcast because I think we can circle back around to that. Uh, maybe after the show, we can we can talk about what lies did we believe that, that took us where we went. So thank you for joining us for the Ask Your Father podcast with Lisa Liu and JR2. And we look forward to getting back together again and uh, seeing what's in your heart that we can help you with. Bless you guys.